Hello friends, welcome to this session of Strongyloid Star Coralis. Uh, today we will be discussing the Strongyloid Star Coralis as well as we will see some miscellaneous elements which we have not studied till now. So the objectives of today's session are general features of Strongyloids, its morphology, its life cycle, it's it's a bit complex, so we need to study that. The pathogenesis and clinical features, its laboratory diagnosis, and finally, prevention and control, the treatment of this. And two uh, miscellaneous topic which we will take, that is larva migrants and trichinella spiralis. So with today's lecture, we are finishing uh, the syllabus of entire parasitology theory. So moving to next slide. The general features of strongyloids. Uh, the name strongyloid star coralis. It is a smallest nematode infecting human being. The name is derived from two words. Strongylus means round and it is resembling and star coralis means fecal because it was first seen in the feces. Found mainly in warm and moist tropics like Brazil and Far East but uh, in a less amount it is found worldwide. The adult worm live in the duodenum and the jejunum of human if we see the morphology of this egg, uh, the female is thin and transparent. The size is very small, around 2.5 millimeter, and thickness is uh, 0.5 millimeter. So here you can see the uh, female one, and this is the male, which is even smaller than that. The it is very shorter, around only one millimeter in the size so very small and one more thing is uh, we fail to see male worm in the human being because it is there in the intestine but not excited in this tool and its lifespan is also too small to be seen so but yes in free living stage it is same because they have free living stage also that we will see in the life cycle part. So there you can see the male which is a this spike cube which is a characteristic feature of this male worm of strongyloids. Female is oviviparous so that means it lays egg but uh, immediately the rapidity form larva would hatch out from the egg. So when you see the stool examination, you will never see the eggs of strongyloids star coralis. What you will see would be the rhabditi form larva. So this is the morphology of rhabditi form larva. This is the buccal cavity. This is bulbar esophagus and this is genital pore. So such type of larva would be seen in the stool examination. Now coming to life cycle. Uh, it is a bit complex because uh, it grows inside the human. The adult worm and its sexual reproduction occurs in the human as well as they have capacity to do it without the help of human also. So we see that human is the natural or the optimum host, but the similar worms, which is uh, morphologically indistinguishable, some strains are seen in the dog and even cat also. So uh, variety of uh, definitive hosts would be there, but human is the main host. The infective form is filariform larva. The root of infection is just like hookworm, that skin penetration or even auto infection. So we will see what auto infection is uh, in the coming slide. Direct development means human would excrete the larva and that larva 
would convert itself into filariform larva and it will infect other human being or indirect development means this larva uh, which is excreted from the human may not require other human being it would develop in the adult form in this soil mm -hmm. that would fertilize and lay the other eggs so that indirect development is also possible we'll see the figure so you can understand it uh, very clear so human is the definitive host that we know uh, that is also known as optimum host and the this filary form larva is the uh, infective form and how human get infection it is by the penetration of the skin so most of the time when this larva is there in the uh, soil and person walks barefooted just like hookwa when it, the feet touches the larva that larva can penetrate through the intake skin this does not require any abrasion or anything but it would penetrate through the skin it would go in the skin then in the blood from blood there would they reach to the heart lung it would break the alveoli crawls up in the respiratory tree and go back from the epiglottis go back into the git and it would develop into adult form in the small intestine so this is the adult form uh, the male worm are not demonstrated in the human so earlier it was also believed that this female worm does not need a male worm for the reproduction but that is not clear but male worm may be there but its lifespan is small so after uh, reproduction they would lay the egg but as we you know that female worm is oviviparous so egg which is deposited in the intestinal mucosa would migrate in the lumen and by that time the repetitive form larva would come out from the egg so what you will see in this tool the diagnostic form is not the egg but the larva of this worm now this larva the simple like hook worm has the ability to convert itself into filary form larva and infect other human being or it may go into free living stage where it would convert into male and the female worm they would fertilize uh, there is sexual reproduction outside the human being so that's called free living cycle it would lay the egg repetitive form larva and this cycle may continue from for several uh, time which would increase the number of worms and few repetitive form larva can again convert into filary form larva and infect human so that is the second so first is the this root just like hookworm second is this root where free living and there is also third root possible that's why it is called complex life cycle and in third root this repetitive form larva would not go in the soil to uh, infect other human being but from the perianal skin it would infect the same person or through the gut it may enter again in the blood of that and that may cause hyperinfection we will see in the pathogenesis and clinical feature what hyperinfection is and why it is so dangerous so that is the life cycle you have to remember what human is the definitive host filary form larva is the infective form and route of entry is through skin now we see the pathogenesis and clinical features uh, there are wide range of clinical range uh, features so it may start uh, some in some person it would be mild asymptomatic to fatal infection which may lead to death of the patient so uh, very wide range if we see pathogenesis due to larva uh, it produces allergic symptom and when it moves it moves really fast 
so that movement would have a check in the skin beneath the skin and that is known as larva currents why currents because currents means racing larva because its movement is so fast that it moves 3 to 4 cm per hour if you compare it other larva migrants cutaneous larva migrants it would hardly move 1 to 2 cm in a day while this moves more than that in one hour so that is why the larva of this which is moving and developing very fast are known as larva currents so that you have to remember may produce bronchopneumonia due to break of the alveoli in intestine due to adult form there would be diarrhea sometime it would be with blood and mucus and one more very unique thing which is there with this worm is the hyperinfection now first you have to understand that for hyperinfection to occur the person's immunity must be deficient there must be some predisposing factor so either it may be immunodeficiency due to hiv aids or some steroid treatment received by the person as a therapy of some other disease a person having lepromatous leprosy and any condition which would decrease its immunity in such person there would be hyperinfection may occur and that is life threat that has a potential of life threatening infection so what happens here is filary foam larva directly enters in arterial blood from the gut so the adult worm lays the egg in the gut it would convert into rhabditive foam larva that rhabditive foam larva need not to come out in the stool but it would convert in gut as a filary foam larva and through gut only it would infect the person so that result in the multifold increase in the number of organism that's why it is very dangerous that larva enters in the blood and lodge in various organs of the body like heart lung brain liver kidney and other organs like lymph node etc so uh, that's why uh, there is a multiplicity in the uh, multifold increase in the number of strongyloids and there would be multiple organ involvement would happen the other thing which which would happen is because this larva would enter in the blood from the gut now you know that gut contains many uh, bacteria especially gram negative bacteria which is normal for a for gut but with this larva it would enter in the sterile body part like blood meninges and that bacteria would also enter with larva in the blood stream person is only already immunodeficient so in such person it would lead to bacterial septicemia meningitis and all other again person may die due to that so that is a one of the complication of hyperinfection so you have to remember that hyperinfection is a unique thing which is associated with strongyloids and that's why even mild and asymptomatic infection of strongyloids should be treated very well because by chance if that person becomes immunodeficient due to any other reason this mild infection would turn into potential fatal complication now coming to lab diagnosis a uh, microscopic examination of stool where you will not see egg like other intestinal helminth but you will see rhabditive foam larva but one thing should be noticed then when the infection is milder uh, repeated stool culture is uh, required because it may not come in the single this so we may go for stool concentration or even culture because this can grow in the free living form so when you do charcoal culture this larva would develop into adult worm and that can be seen very easily or serology can be done uh, by complement fixation test or nowadays elisa is done with a crude antigen of uh, this strongyloids 
so that is lab diagnosis prevention and control so this it is intestinal nematodes so proper disposal of feces and the uh, avoidance of walking barefooted in uh, the contaminated soil is the key but treatment is very important all patient must be treated so even asymptomatic and having mild symptom infection should be treated because it may have a capacity to produce severe disease and ivermectin is preferred over arbendazone to treat this so uh, that finishes strongyloids uh, larva migrants are the migrating larva which are moving aimless wandering in the body so most of the time the non human nematodes when it enters in the human by any route may not complete its life cycle may not be able to complete its life cycle so it would be moving so they are known as larva migrant there are two type one is cutaneous which moves in the skin so when route of entry is skin penetration mostly non human hookworms like ankylostoma brasiliensis and caniam are the main cause the human hookworm would produced creeping or eruption or the ground itch but it would be transient because they would after that they would enter in the blood stream and they would develop its further life cycle other is visceral larva migrants when following ingestion it occurs basically the roundworm of other animals like toxocara canis and toxocara cati are responsible for visceral lar larva migrants and one more worm which uh, is of uh, importance is trichinella spiralis uh, again it is very small nematodes 1.5 to 3 mm in size pig is the optimum host but can also infect human being usually human get infection by eating raw or undercooked meat most commonly it is pork but it may occur in other animal also so that can also transmit the infection uh, female is viviporous it lives in the intestine of the human being uh, giving birth to larvae that larvae get entry into the blood stream and deposit in the various uh, part of the body but when it reach into striated muscle it get encysted to form such cyst like structure clear so these are the cyst of the trichinella spiralis clear human being is basically dead for the parasite but when it is developed in some other animal when that is ingested by human being human get such cyst can be diagnosed by the biopsy of the involved muscle or by the serology so with this we finish today's lecture in summary uh, what you have to remember is strongyloid sarcoralis life cycle is complex because it may occur in human as well as free living human may get infection through uh, skin entry from the soil or even auto infection or even hyper infection from gut itself they need not to go outside and hyper infection is a potentially uh, very complicated and the serious uh, it leads to serious illness so with this we finish today's lecture and with this we finish uh, the theory session of parasitology and the helmet thank you very much for attending this session we'll meet with practical session in next session thank you